Hello and welcome to Weekly News Highlights. I'm Kim Dami in Seoul. Let's recap the week with keywords that made headlines. Israel and Hezbollah have agreed to a ceasefire to end nearly 14 months of fighting. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu stressed the pauses to focus on the Iranian threat and to increase pressure on Hamas in Gaza. A rare November snowstorm hit South Korea's capital this week, piling up 40 centimeters of snow over just two days. The record snow led to reports of injuries, blackouts and even fatalities. The Bank of Korea wrapped up the year with one last rate cut, a surprise move that clearly indicates the central bank's focus on reviving economic growth momentum, with sluggish exports and uncertainty stemming from the incoming Trump administration. A ceasefire deal to end 13 months of conflict between Israel and the Iran-backed military group Hezbollah has taken effect. Under the 60-day deal that U.S. President Joe Biden claims to be a permanent cessation of hostilities, Israel and Hezbollah agreed to withdraw forces from Lebanon. Our Choi Soo-hyung searches off. A deadly cross-border conflict between Israel and the Lebanon-based Hezbollah has now entered a 60-day ceasefire. On Tuesday, U.S. President Joe Biden announced that a U.S. and France-led ceasefire initiative started at 4 a.m. on Wednesday. He also said this could lead to a permanent cessation of hostilities. I'm pleased to announce that their governments have accepted the United States' proposal to end the devastating conflict between Israel and Hezbollah. Effective at 4 a.m. tomorrow local time, the fighting across the Lebanese-Israeli border will end. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu announced a ceasefire on Tuesday evening, stating that the promised agreement had been fulfilled. I have said many times that a good agreement is an agreement that is enforced and we will enforce it. The Iranian government, which has long opposed Israel and supported the Lebanese-based militant group Hezbollah with weapons and funds, said it was pleased to welcome the ceasefire between the two sides. South Korea has also welcomed and thanked the country's diplomatic efforts involved in ceasefire negotiations. Following the agreement, Israel will withdraw its troops from southern Lebanon during the ceasefire period. Lebanese forces will reclaim control of areas currently held by Hezbollah. Hezbollah will remove its fighters and weapons from an area south of Lebanon's Litani River, established as the boundary following the 2006 Israel-Hezbollah war. Netanyahu emphasized that if Hezbollah breaks a ceasefire deal, he will strike back right away. Experts said that Hezbollah would focus more on its eternal issues for now. So, you know, multinational forces are going to be observing and trying to prevent anything that would violate the ceasefire. Right now, I, I think, you know, even though it's, it's always difficult to predict, but uh, I think it seems like Hezbollah will probably lay low and focus on domestic concern. Meanwhile, Israel carried out an intensive airstrike in Beirut before the agreement went into effect. AFP reported that the Israeli military issued an evacuation warning in Beirut and conducted around 20 attacks on the outskirts of Beirut, targeting Hezbollah military bases. The 60-day ceasefire temporarily pauses fighting. The locals say has killed nearly 4,000 people since it started. Cha Tsuyang, Arirang News. President Yoon Song-yeol on Wednesday hosted a Ukrainian delegation led by its defense minister to discuss effective cooperation against the illegal military cooperation between Russia and North Korea. Our Oh soo has the details. President Yoon Song-yeol met with a Ukrainian delegation to discuss how to counter the growing military cooperation between Russia and North Korea. According to Yoon's office, the South Korean leader on Wednesday met with the visiting delegation led by Kyiv's Defence Minister Rustam Umarov at the Yongsan Presidential Office. During their talks, Yoon called for hold on Kyiv to devise practical and effective strategies to address the threat posed by Moscow and Pyongyang. As Umarov provided an update on Ukraine's war situation and North Korea's troop movements, the Ukrainian minister expressed gratitude for South Korea's support which has provided tangible assistance to the Ukrainian people and expressed hope for strengthening their cooperation in the future. He said the delegation is visiting after President Volodymyr Zelensky ordered him to explore cooperation with South Korea amid Russia and North Korea's military collaboration. The delegation's visit was announced late October following a phone call between Yoon and Zelensky after South Korean intelligence confirmed North Korean troops were being deployed to fight for Russia and Ukraine. 
The delegation held further talks with National Security Advisor Shin won sik and Defense Minister Kim Jong-un to explore further avenues for bilateral cooperation. The two sides agreed to continue intel sharing on North Korea's troop deployments and the regime's arms and technology transfers with the Kremlin. They will also work closely with allied nations to address these issues. The top office did not mention or comment on whether Ukraine had asked for weapon support. However, observers believe artillery and air defense systems may have been requested, as hinted by the Ukrainian president last month, when he said the delegation will soon visit South Korea. So far, South Korea has only provided non-lethal military gear such as bulletproof vests. However, in recent weeks, Seoul has said it will classify weapons into either defensive or offensive categories. It would consider providing defensive weapons first and adjust its response in stages proportionately to developments. Going forward, Seoul will coordinate with Washington on its future decisions regarding the Ukraine war. Yoon's office says as the Biden administration and President-elect Trump's team are responding to the Ukraine crisis as a unified team. South Korea will maintain close communication and cooperation with the U.S. to ensure all decisions are made within the framework of their bilateral cooperation. Oh Soo-young, Arirang News. U.S. President-elect Donald Trump's team is considering arranging direct talks with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, according to sources familiar with the matter, though nothing has been set in stone or decided by the president-elect. But if direct talks between Trump and Kim do happen, it'll be the first return to dialogue in more than five years. Our Lee Soo-jin tells us more. U.S. President-elect Donald Trump's team is considering re-engaging with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, which may lead to a diplomatic and political shift on the Korean Peninsula. Reuters reported on Tuesday local time that two people familiar with the matter said that Trump's team is weighing the possibility of direct talks with Kim in the hope of lowering the risk of armed conflict. This comes as Trump appointed Alex Wong, who played a key role in his Singapore and Hanoi summits with Kim, as Deputy National Security Advisor, heightening speculation about a renewed interest in pursuing dialogue with North Korea. Trump met with the North Korean leader a total of three times during his first term, at the summit in Singapore in 2018, Hanoi in February 2019, and then a third impromptu meeting at the DMZ a couple months later on June 2019. The U.S. president-elect also hinted at his interest in talks between the U.S. and North Korea in his speech at the Republican National Convention in July, saying that he will get along with Kim if he takes office again. But there are still major hurdles to overcome before a U.S.-North Korea summit takes place. It's unclear whether North Korea would be willing to re-engage with Trump after four years of no direct dialogue between the North and the Biden administration, with Kim instead focusing on advancing North Korea's missile capabilities and relations with Russia. There are also more pressing foreign matters such as the war in Ukraine and the Middle East, as well as domestic issues that Trump has vowed to address from his first day in office. But with his team considering talks with North Korea during the transition period, a summit with Kim may be sought soon after the inauguration on January 20. If such a summit takes place, it would be crucial for South Korea to be included in order for security interests in the region to not be undermined, especially in regard to denuclearization. Lee Soo Jin, Arirang News. President Yoon Suk-yeol hosted his Malaysian counterpart, Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim, here in Seoul on Monday. Their talk summit talks are largely involved advancing the two countries' partnership in defense and critical minerals. Our correspondent Oh Seung covered the meeting. South Korea and Malaysia have formed a strategic partnership as their leaders on Monday agreed to strengthen cooperation in defense technology and core minerals. This came as President Yoon suk yeol and Malaysian Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim sat down for a bilateral summit at the Yongsan Presidential Office in Seoul. Ahead of the 65th anniversary of diplomatic relations next year, the two sides agreed to establish a strategic partnership as they jointly pursue freedom, peace and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific region. First, Yun and Anwar agreed to deepen political and security cooperation through regular dialogue at various levels between public bodies. To ramp up defence cooperation, the two sides will encourage industrial collaboration, with South Korea expected to start delivering light attack aircraft to Malaysia in 2026. They will also promote exchanges between defense authorities and collaborate on maritime security and law enforcement. 
On economic cooperation, the two sides will aim to conclude their free trade agreement negotiations by next year and focus on technological cooperation, particularly in fields such as artificial intelligence, the digital economy and green initiatives. They will further cooperate on infrastructure, such as in transportation and smart city development, as well as on green energy as they both pursue carbon neutrality. The two nations also agreed to sign a Memorandum of Understanding on Critical Minerals Cooperation. Malaysia ranks ninth globally in rare earth minerals reserves. Yunnan Anwar touched upon furthering healthcare cooperation as well as greater exchanges in tourism and education. They also discussed regional and global issues of mutual concern, with the two leaders both condemning North Korea's ballistic missile launches. They called for the complete, verifiable and irreversible dismantlement of Pyongyang's nuclear missile programs and expressed concerns over its military cooperation with Russia. Yun and Ibrahim affirmed their support for Malaysia, chairing the Association of Southeast Asian Nations and South Korea hosting the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Summit next year. Oh Seong, Arirang News. U.S. President-elect Donald Trump has reaffirmed his plan to implement significant tariffs on key U.S. trade partners starting on the first day of his administration next year. What will be the consequence be and how realizable is his plan actually? Our economics correspondent Lee Soo-jin joins us in the studio to discuss. Welcome, Soo-jin. Thank you for having me. So, Soo-jin, let's start with what the Trump's most recent tariffs plans are. Sure. So U.S. President like Donald Trump on Monday announced on his social media platform Truth Social that he will set massive new tariffs on China, Mexico and Canada. This includes a 25 percent tariff on all products from the neighboring countries of Canada and Mexico to remain in effect until those countries take action to stop the flow of drugs and illegal migrants crossing into the United States. He has also announced plans to increase existing tariffs by an additional 10% on all goods imported from China until the Chinese government implements measures to combat drug smuggling, particularly of the synthetic opioid fentanyl. Washington estimates that almost 75,000 Americans were killed by fentanyl last year. And these tariffs are expected to take effect on January 20, 2025, the first day of his administration, as one of his first executive orders. Well, Su Jin, U.S. President Joe Biden also commented on Trump's tariff plan, saying that Trump should reconsider considering the, trap, the tariff threats are going to be counterproductive. Tell us more about that. Right. So we saw on the campaign trail that Donald Trump had repeatedly threatened big tariff hikes as part of his America First agenda, which seeks to bolster domestic industries. And while these efforts are intended to boost U.S. industries and the economy as a whole, they may ra raise prices for U.S. consumers. Here's what experts said might happen. Uh, but a, a lot of American companies, especially automobile companies, are very worried because the automobile industry, uh, the U.S. automobile companies who have factories in Detroit depend on factories in Ottawa for their parts and uh, raw material. And this may lead to manufacturers relying on imported materials passing the higher production costs onto buyers. But while the impact of tariffs, according to experts, will be felt most by U.S. consumers, economies across the world will also see higher costs. Uh, but other countries, because they have to uh, keep U.S. in mind, will have to strengthen their monitoring systems and so on. So it will mean a rise in uh, trade-related costs for everybody, and it will also mean that uh, there might be retaliatory tariffs. Now, Sujin, we have to talk about what the tariffs plans are or are going to mean for South Korea. So I think that's what everyone's really interested in. Well, the tariffs imposed on Canada and Mexico, these are two of U.S.'s most largest, closest trading partners, mm -hmm. signal that South Korea is highly also likely to be subject to these high tariff hikes. Let's take a listen to what an expert thinks will happen. Tariffs ranging from 10 to 20 percent more are expected to be imposed. If that is the case, the volume of exports from South Korea to the United States will drop. But here's what South Korean companies can do to minimize the impact. But the best we can do is to first point out how important Korean goods are for the American markets and American consumers. And second, I think we need to bargain hard uh, 
uh, we need to show that there will be consequences not only on the Korean markets, but American markets as well. The government is also moving to prepare proactive scenario-based response measures. The presidential office held an emergency meeting on Wednesday led by Chief of Staff of Foreign Policy, Song Tae-yoon, to evaluate the potential effects of proposed U.S. tariffs on Korean businesses. Song warned that these tariffs could harm Korean firms relying on parts from Mexico and Canada for U.S.-based manufacturing. And although the direct impact on Korean firms from Chinese tariffs may be limited, reduced Chinese exports to the U.S. could hurt Korea's intermediate good exports to China. Then are there any other factors that will make it highly unlikely for the proposed tariffs to you know, materialize as planned? Yes, there are actually several that we can talk about. And it's unclear how Trump will be able to carry out his plans as many goods coming to the U.S. from Mexico and China are exempted from tariffs under the terms of the United States-Mexico-Canada agreement that was actually negotiated during Trump's first term and went into effect in 2020. The agreement was made to modernize trade rules while maintaining tariff-free trade for most goods exchanged between the three countries, and the 25% tariff would undermine this. It also includes mechanisms to resolve trade disputes, meaning if the U.S. imposes unilateral tariffs, it would, it would expose the U.S. to legal challenges buying Mexico and Canada. And according to U.S. Census Bureau data for September 2024 on goods traded, Mexico is the largest trading partner of the U.S., followed by Canada and China, the very three countries that he has said he would impose tariffs on. As for China, while it's not part of a formal trade agreement with the U.S. like Mexico and Canada, their trade relationship is still governed by the World Trade Organization, which they're both members of, that seeks to limit unilateral tariffs. This is why it is seen more as a, as a move to pressure trade partners into renegotiating terms that favor the United States, leveraging the threat of tariffs as a bargaining tool instead of putting them into effect directly. Well, Su Jin, we'll have to get back to you on the first day of his uh, back to the office. Thank you for the wrap up today. No problem, anytime. In a largely unexpected move, the Bank of Korea slashed its key rate yet again by 25 basis points to 3 percent, while sharing a somber economic prospect. Our correspondent Moon Hye-dan tells us why. South Korea's central bank has lowered its benchmark interest rate by 25 basis points to 3 percent amid stagnant economic growth. The decision was announced on Thursday following the last Monetary Policy Committee meeting of the year. Although exchange rates have become more volatile, inflation is stable and household debt growth has slowed. However, downward pressure on growth has increased, so the Monetary Policy Committee decided to cut the interest rate further to help reduce these risks. Last month, the BOK implemented a pivot in monetary policy for the first time in over three years, as it slashed the base rate by 25 basis points. The second rate cut in a row comes despite the weakening one against the greenback, following the re-election of former U.S. President Donald Trump as the BOK focuses on economic conditions here at home. Economic growth in South Korea has been stunted this year, starting off strong with 1.3% GDP growth in the first quarter, followed by a 0.2% decline in the second quarter. Although the BOK had anticipated a turnaround in the third quarter as a predicted growth of 0.5% back in August, recent data show that it only came to 0.1%. As a result, the central bank revised its economic growth projections for this year and next year by 0.2 percentage points, from 2.4% to 2.2% for 2024 and from 2.1% to 1.9% 2 for 2025. The BOK attributed the weakened economic growth to a slowdown in export growth and said that export growth is likely to fall short of initial expectations due to intensified competition and a possible rise in global trade protectionism. In an economic slowdown, lowering the interest rate can help boost consumption and investment, as well as reduce burdens on small businesses. Analysts say that further rate cuts could come in the near future, but this carries risks. Lower future estimate for growth was the reason for lower interest rate, which means that there are 
higher possibility now uh, that Bank of Korea will lower the rates. Uh, it may uh, decide to lower the rates faster than it had previously signaled, uh, but there are significant problems to lowering the interest rate. For example, it may strike a bubble in the Seoul housing market. It may increase household and corporate debt even higher. Going forward, the Bank of Korea says it will continue to monitor economic growth and financial stability and thoroughly assess the impact of the rate cut on foreign exchange and other policy variables in order to determine the pace of further cuts in the future. Moon hye Arirang News. Findings for the third quarter show a rebound in the number of newborns, which rose 8 percent on year. Now, the country could see an annual increase in the number of births for the first time in almost a decade if this trend continues. Our Moon Haedan has more. The number of births in South Korea saw a surprising rebound in the third quarter, surging at rates unseen in more than a decade. According to data released by Statistics Korea on Wednesday, the total number of births between July and September came to just over 61,000, surging by 8 percent compared to the same period last year. Such a year-on-year -year increase has not been recorded since the fourth quarter of 2012. This brings the total fertility rate, the average number of children a woman will have during her reproductive years, to 0.76, up 0.05 from the previous year. It comes as the total number of births in September this year tallied up to 20,590, which is more than 10 percent higher than the same month in 2023, marking the highest increase for the month of September since 2010. If this trend continues, the country could see an annual increase in the number of births for the first time in nine years. On Tuesday, the Presidential Committee on Aging Society and Population Policy predicted that the annual total fertility rate will come to 0.74. The government attributed the incline to the continued rise in the number of marriages recorded, as figures showed a sharp uptick of nearly 19 per cent in September and 24 per cent in the third quarter compared to last year. A spokesperson from Statistics Korea also commented on the increase in the number of women in their 30s, as well as changing views on having children. There are more women in their early 30s, and as you can see, the number of births from mothers in their 30s showed a large increase. And in a recent survey, we were able to find that views on having children are changing in a positive way, as did a survey taken by the Presidential Committee on Aging Society and Population Policy. Data shows that the birth rate for women aged between 30 to 34 years old had the sharpest year-on-year -year increase in the third quarter of this year, rising by 6.6 percent. Experts also say that it's worth noting that the large increase this year should be viewed as a base effect of a nearly 15 percent decline in September last year, and that population policies introduced at the start of this year will begin to reflect in the data next year. There were several new policies introduced at the start of the year that could have an effect, targeting newlyweds, the main group that will have children. So if there is to be an effect, it will start showing slowly next year. Meanwhile, the number of deaths exceeded that of the number of births in the third quarter of this year, meaning that the country's population saw a natural decline of more than 28,000. Moon Haryan, Arirang News. We had the season's first snow this Wednesday, and it was a rare November snowstorm. Heavy snowfall hit South Korea's capital's hall for two straight days from Wednesday. And just on Wednesday, the heaviest snow accumulation of the day reached nearly 20 centimeters during the daytime. And that's the heaviest snow recorded on any day in November in 117 years. Cold air passing over the West Sea created snow clouds due to the sea air temperature difference. The sea surface temperature was 2 to 3 degrees Celsius higher, intensifying the snow clouds. And along with the expanding Siberian high-pressure system, this time the snow clouds followed the westerly winds into the capital region unexpectedly. And with more snowfall the following day, Saur, in fact, saw up to 40 centimeters of snow. There were at least six snow-related deaths, and power shortages affected thousands of households as electricity lines were damaged by falling trees and snow-related accidents. The unprecedented snow also impacted travel throughout the country, grounding flights and delaying trains. 
And now that the snow is uh, melting away and the temperatures are warming up here in the metropolitan area, do check out Seoul's top 10 hiking trails that offer some of the best scenic views of the city. Our An Songjin has the guideline. Lucia loves hiking, especially since she came to Korea a year ago. Bukhansan, Inwangsan, Gwanaksan. Mountain after mountain, she has hiked at least 10 peaks in Seoul. What's helped her enjoy hiking even more are the various programs offered by the Seoul Hiking Tourism Center, which is run by the Seoul Tourism Organization. We have this wonderful hiking center that uh, organizes these tours for free, and the guides are very attentive and very helpful and friendly. The center runs roughly four hikes a week. Applicants sign up online and then turn up at the meeting point and hike. On a day with great fall weather like this, even hiking beginners like myself can fully immerse in the beautiful mountain scenery in Seoul. I've made a lot of friends here, uh, and it's so easy because everyone usually comes alone and kind of searches the same thing. It's not just hiking on offer. The hiking center offers other programs such as an indoor sports activities, fortress tours, tea ceremonies, temple visits, and various other events that show a glimpse of Korea's natural landscape. For those that are in need of gear, the Seoul Hiking Tourism Center offers rentals as well. From hiking poles to outdoor jackets, whether you come prepared or not, it's no problem. It's really rare that um, there are mountains near the big city like Seoul. Uh, it's not only um, important for just looking at Seoul city, but when you hike up, you can see all the scenery of Seoul, and this is really fascinating. So we thought that could be the new trend of K-tourism. With the center providing everything you need, why not take a stroll or hike up the mountain the next time you're in Seoul? Han Songjin, Arirang News. That's all we have for this weekend. Thanks for watching and stay safe wherever you are.